Puberty blockers can make the mental health of some young people worse, not better. The total inverse of what we're told is the case with puberty blockers. Ah, oh, it's just really upsetting. Hey, we are going to have a look here into the findings of the biggest ever review on transgender healthcare and gender affirming care for children and for teenagers. The findings here, the results of this are absolutely damning in terms of gender affirming care, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, all of that sort of medical intervention. You're just going to see that that is totally untenable. It is not based in any sort of science. The claims that people make about this are totally unfounded and it is really not good for our children and for our young people. Shout out to Rebecca McLaughlin from the Gospel Coalition. She does a lot of really good stuff about gender and sexuality. She's really good on that. And she has compiled this to look at four four findings, four things that people often say about the need for trans gender affirming care, trans health care for teenagers that are actually just not based in any truth or any science. She says here she's not going to focus on theological or pastoral reflections. Um, but I'm going to add a little bit of that because I'm a youth worker. I care a lot about teenagers and children. And whenever you read this stuff and you think this could be happening to teenagers that I know, it's actually really upsetting and it's like frustrating that this has been the case. This is the way that these people have been treated for very long. And oh, it's not good. It's really not good. The first thing, the first um, point she wants to make is that here we see adolescent gender dysphoria does not predict adult identification. So people have kind of always said that if you're trans, you're trans. That is an innate part of you. It's as unchangeable as your hair color, or well, not your hair color, your eye color, I guess, or your height. It's just part of who you are. You can't change it. But people have often kicked back against that and said, I think a lot of studies have shown that between 70 and 90% of people who experience gender dysphoria or report gender dysphoria as teenagers if they don't have any sort of treatment if they don't pursue that then 70 to 90 percent of them will grow out of it this is essentially what this review found said that um dysphoria gender dysphoria in childhood not reliably predictive of whether that person will have long-standing gender incongruence or whether medical intervention will be the best option for them she goes on to um, look at some of the studies around how many people pursue further transition, how many people grow out of these feelings and that number of like persistence rates of 10 to 33 percent in adolescence. So 10 only of the however many, it's like over, well over a thousand a year in the NHS the last few years, only 10 to 33 percent of those people will go on to have further treatment the rest will realize that they're actually not trans that in her words that they might grow up and realize that actually they are same-sex attracted adult adults who identified with their biological sex this is like people have been saying this for a long time the next thing oh right puberty blockers puberty blockers are sold as like a a pause button okay where as you are coming into puberty and your body starts to change if you're experiencing gender dysphoria you're thinking okay I'm a guy I don't want my shoulders to get broader I don't want to develop a sort of masculine frame or if you're a girl a more feminine frame so I'm going to take puberty blockers it's going to hit pause on this thing until I decide what what's going on with my gender what I want to be and then if I want I can go on to have more uh, intervention or I can just stop taking the puberty blockers and continue on as normal. This is what puberty blockers are sold as. Totally, totally debunked by this. Like, <laughs> it's totally debunked. Page 32 of this report. Let's have a look. This is... Ooh, this is not good. Okay, original rationale for use of puberty blockers was that it would buy time to think, allow you to postpone puberty so you'd have a bit more time. Um... Oh, sheesh. The University of York found multiple studies demonstrating that puberty blockers exert their intended effect, so they do block puberty, but also that bone density is compromised during puberty suppression. Like These are the, the long-term health effects that opponents of gender-affirming care for teenagers have 
they've been talking about this for a long time in terms of fertility and bone density and the advocates for this healthcare have said whoa 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 no that's not true clearly it is another one no changes in gender dysphoria or body satisfaction were demonstrated insufficient or inconsistent evidence about the effects of puberty suppression on psychological or psychosocial well-being cognitive development cardiometabolic risk or fertility so essentially we're not really sure what impact this has on fertility we know that there's no change in gender dysphoria or body satisfaction in people who take puberty blockers in adolescence and also this is something that has been said and seems to be backed up by this huge review around 98 percent of people who go on to puberty blockers will continue on to have further medical intervention they'll continue on to have their cross-sex hormones but keep in mind that that stat of like between 70 or 67 and 90 percent of people who don't pursue medical intervention between 67 and 90 percent of those people will outgrow their feelings of dysphoria and realize okay i'm same sex attracted but if you put them on puberty blockers almost 98 percent about 98 percent of them will go on to take cross-sex hormones The reviews letter to the NHS in England advised that because puberty, puberty blockers only have clearly defined benefits in quite narrow circumstances and because of the potential risks to neurocognitive development, psychosexual development and longer term bone health, they should only be offered under a research protocol. So essentially, the only reason that the NHS are going to give teenagers puberty blockers is if they're participating in scientific research on the effects of puberty blockers interesting this one here okay advocates for puberty blockers uh, said that they ease gender dysphoria and improve body image and psychosocial well-being we saw that there in the report that the puberty blockers have no significant what was the no change in no changes in gender dysphoria or body satisfaction it says here um on page 179 of the report there's no evidence that puberty blockers improve body image or dysphoria and very limited evidence for positive mental health outcomes which without a control group could be due to placebo effect or non-concomitant -com psychological support so essentially the studies done are pretty bad um people might a study might have said look these people took puberty blockers and it impacted their mental well-being in a positive way but there wasn't a control for like okay are these people also receiving counseling and therapy no that thing about the oh, psychological psychosocial well-being cognitive development cardiometabolic risk fertility those are big things to be playing with and to be risking whenever you're 12. <sighs> number three out of four puberty blockers and cross sex hormones are not life-saving medicines you hear this all the time people say would you rather have a living son or a dead daughter as if that is the inevitable outcome of not providing gender affirming care for teenagers that okay they will they will take their own lives it's been suggested that hormone treatment reduces the elevated risk of death by that there in this population but the evidence found did not support this conclusion there's no evidence that would you rather have a a living son or a dead daughter there's no evidence that that is the inevitable outcome of not providing trans affirming gender affirming treatment there's a funny one the percentage of people who detransitioned remains unknown there's not enough long-term studies done i remember i think the university of bath were going to have a guy do a phd on that and then there was a big upcry and didn't do it don't quote me on that exactly i can't remember if it was bath but i'm pretty sure like that that was a thing now here this is oh <laughs> interesting but rough that says far from confirming the mental health benefits of puberty blockers the preliminary findings from the uk's 2011 early intervention study suggested that puberty blockers can make the mental health of some young people worse not better i said like puberty blockers can make the mental health of some young people worse not better the total inverse of what we're told is the case with puberty blockers based on um parental report they found that 
birth registered females who went on to puberty blockers had a worsening of internalizing problems depression anxiety so they go on to puberty blockers because their parents and the doctors are told this will help with their depression and anxiety this will help with the problems they're having it'll help help them to have a better body image and it gets worse <laughs> like they become more depressed and more anxious in response to the youth report youth self-report scale significant increase after one year on treatment in adolescents scoring the statement i deliberate deliberately try to hurt or as sometimes true so after one year on treatment more of these young people are saying that yeah sometimes i deliberately tried to hurt or myself rebecca mclaughlin goes on to talk about why puberty blockers are so common that's a whole other discussion um interestingly the correlation between a trans identity and neurodivergence of some sort asd adhd um is really really high and a correlation doesn't equal causation so essentially if i eat an apple every day and then stop eating apples and i break my wrist i didn't break my wrist because i stopped eating apples however if there's really strong and consistent correlation then it's worth looking into whether there's causation there and we, we don't have the data for that but we know that studies have found that trans identifying people are three to six times more likely to be autistic than their peers they show higher levels than expected of asd adhd anxiety depression eating disorders hmm that there self and adverse childhood experiences so say like before the age of i think it's maybe five if you have some sort of trauma that you may or may not remember it has a really like formative effect on you going forward studies plural have found that about half of all kids referred to gender services had been affected by maternal mental illness or substance abuse while almost a quarter had been exposed to domestic violence here's more stuff we'll not get into this too much but whenever you match the the mental well-being of the trans population and teenagers with general teenagers the general mental well-being and health of teenagers is better than their trans identifying peers which leads people to say okay trans people are more mentally unwell what they need is support and um acceptance of their gender and so that will improve their mental well-being whereas actually the the data here shows that the difference between those two groups the um trans group and the oh what's that word the current word for it is escaping me because I had a baby recently and baby brain's a thing the non-trans teenagers once you factor in okay well who needs specialist level mental health treatment once you factor that in then the differences in their mental health and well-being leveled out okay so this popular idea that trans identifying kids are suffering because they're trans that gender affirming care and social acceptance will resolve their mental health challenges it's not true the evidence does not adequately support the claim that gender affirming treatment reduces that the risk of that so then why why are people doing it okay here's a good one that there's been an, a huge growth in the number of people identifying as trans um you so see here in the stats in the uk 2009 15 15 female adolescents were referred to the uk's gender clinic that tavistock clinic and 24 males but by 2016 1071 teenage females and 426 adolescent males a huge huge jump it says per record keeping like come on how can you keep per records with this sort of thing um people will often say and this is noted noted in the cast report here that a common explanation put forward for why there's so many more trans people is that those trans people have always been there and they've always been trans but because there's greater social acceptance and awareness of it then they feel more able to come out and so they're able to pursue what they would have always wanted anyway and that is just really tenuous let's have a look at page 26 okay here it is the exponential change in referrals over a particularly short five-year time frame is very much faster than what than would be expected for normal evolution of acceptance of a minority group so it's unlikely that this huge boom in people identifying as trans is exclusively because it's more 
societally accepted. It also doesn't explain why this huge switch has happened from, like, what was it, 15 guys, 24 girls? No, 15 girls, 24 guys, fewer guys, fewer girls, more guys, to suddenly, like, the vast majority of people presenting the gender clinics are girls. They talk about what has driven that and the impact of social media is really pinpointed as a potential cause of that because it was in and around 2014, 2015 that you saw this huge flip in terms of, well, this huge boom in terms of how many people are presenting at gender identity clinics and also the flip of the it being male dominant to female dominant. There's stuff here about how social media has just had a, a terrible effect on the um, mental health and well-being of teenagers especially girls in terms of their like body image self-worth that sort of thing like this is if you if you do any work with teenagers if you know teenagers or if you are a teenager you know that instagram is shafting you the review also heard accounts of female students in schools forming intense friendships with other gender questioning or transgender students at school and then identifying as trans themselves this like there's not the data to suggest this but this just makes total sense to me I think that given that people who identify as trans are three to six times more likely to be neurodivergent in some way you've got girls who it's really hard to actually diagnose girls with autism because they hide it a little better but imagine just a girl she's 14 and she's able to put on a bit of a front and seem like she's just like everybody else but internally she feels different to everybody she doesn't quite understand the jokes that they say she doesn't know the social norms she pretends that she does and does a good job of that but doesn't quite feel like she fits in there's just something she knows that is different about her and then she goes on instagram and sees all of these people who look a certain way and she thinks okay i don't look this way i'm not happy with my body and then you come across a tiktok one day that is from a, a trans person who says this is how I felt I felt like I didn't fit in I wasn't comfortable in my body and this girl thinks yeah okay that's me and then the person says then I realized I was trans and suddenly okay there's a seed planted maybe I'm trans and here then you have okay if you've one trans person and then generally this other these other female students form an intense friendship with them and then start to identify as trans themselves can you not see how this isn't as easy as like oh these people have always been trans and they're just discovering it no there's a definite social contagion element here and ah oh, it's just really upsetting especially when we know that like the vast majority of these people would grow out of these feelings we know that acting on it and getting the cross sex hormones and the puberty blockers is potentially going to have a negative, like a worsening impact on your mental health and well-being. It's not going to improve your anxiety or depression, which, as it was said somewhere in the article and in the study here, those were probably already there and aren't secondary to your gender dysphoria. Because so often people present at gender clinics, but they have previously and already had anxiety and depression and all of these other mental health struggles okay some theological reflections very quickly uh, living outside of god's will for us is not good whenever god made the world he made humans he said it's good it's good it's very good then humans decided that they wanted to live separate from god and that's when things became not good the same is true now that god made us male and female in his image whenever we try and push against that that's not good for us because we're not machines that we can augment ourselves and change ourselves. We're creatures, we're created beings, and so we have limits. We're created to be a certain way by God, and trying to act outside of that way is not going to be good for us, even if we want to. You also see here that the the effect of the fall on every area of human life and the human person is just so profound. And um, for myself, like I'm I'm not trans, but the the fault lines run through my personality and my view of myself and my sexuality and my willpower and my reasoning and my intellect all of the things the fault lines of the fall run through me and it's going to present differently in me than it is someone who's trans but they still run deep and 
that's an explanation i think for why we can feel so strongly a certain way and still be wrong now then to get into the pastoral reflections and like how we engage with people who experience gender dysphoria who um are feeling like this it can be easy to read this stuff and be like haha the liberals this is a big l for them like we win but these people people who identify as trans are not our enemies people and especially trans people aren't our enemies they are the victims of this ideology ephesians 6 tells us our struggles not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms there's a lot in that but it's essentially saying that people aren't our enemies we're not fighting against them we're fighting for them and this is reflected in the way that jesus interacted with people he didn't just treat people as like ideological enemies or political enemies whenever he associated with people who were tax collectors and sinners the religious leaders asked him why are you doing that and he didn't say oh because i affirm them or he didn't say because i'm trying to beat them in an argument here he said it's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick i've not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance and so he recognized that, that these are people who are sick but that they are also people aside from their sickness their sickness their sin does not define them and so we apply that to how we view trans people and we think okay these are trans people but they are people made in the image of god they need jesus just as much as i need jesus and just because they're trans doesn't mean that they are beyond the love of jesus or that they're too far gone they need him just as much as i do because without jesus i would i would be doing all sorts of things i would be a mess jesus didn't try and beat them down with arguments instead he developed a relationship with them to show them that he was better than whatever they were basing their identity on he was better than whatever they were getting their value from and so i think for us as christians we really need to understand transgenderism on a like quite a deep level i guess we need to understand um something of the trans experience we need to know the language we need to know what the bible teaches and we need to know how to then apply that to those people and how to relate to them not so that we can be right not so that we can be like haha you lose woke people no we don't do this so that we can win we do this so that we can help people to see jesus questions around sexuality and gender are probably the biggest questions of our generation um, which is I think why I talk about it so much and have so much stuff on it so like if you want to hear any more stuff about sexuality and gender then like watch one of these I'll maybe put a playlist here let me know what you think and I'll see you soon god bless